Good morning, dear students. Today we are going to start with the next topic, which is perceptual constancies. The sensory information that we receive from our environment constantly changes when we move from one place to another. But many a times you must have wondered that how we are able to form a stable perception of an object seen from any position and in any intensity of light. Well, here, the perception of the objects is relatively stable, despite the changes in the stimulation of sensory receptors is known as perceptual constancy. So the tendency to perceive as maintaining stable properties, despite the differences in distance, viewing angle, at this, uh, in the viewing angle and lighting is known as perceptual constancy. There are various types of perceptual constancies that we are going to study right now. The first one is known as the size constancies. The size of an image on our retina changes with the change in the distance of the object from the eye. As the object moves farther away, the smaller becomes the image. On the other hand, it has also been shown that within limits, the object appears to be of the same size irrespective of its distance. For example, when you are approaching your friend from a distance, your perception of the friend's size does not change, despite the fact that the retinal image has become larger. This tendency for the perceived size of the objects to, relive, to remain relatively unchanged with the changes in the distance from the observer is known as size constancy. Next we come to is the shape constancy. In our perceptions, the shapes of familiar objects remain unchanged despite the changes in the pattern of retinal image resulting from differences in their orientation. For example, a dinner plate will look at the, the same shape, whether the image that it casts on the retina is a circle or it is an oval shape like an ellipse or roughly a short line. It is known as form constancy or shape constancy. Last is the brightness constancy. The brightness of the objects is perceived to be constant, even though there are changes in the illumination that makes the objects appear brighter or lighter. In other words, our experience of brightness does not change despite the changes in the amount of reflected light reaching our eyes. This tendency to maintain an apparent brightness constant under different amount of illumination is known as brightness constancy. For example, a white paper will appear to be white, even if it is viewed in a complete pitch black, uh, you know, or a dark room. So similarly, the coal that looks black in the sun also looks black in room light. Now we come to the concept of illusions. Our perceptions are not always veridical. Sometimes we fail to interpret the sensory information correctly. Therefore, there is a mismatch between the physical stimuli and the perception. These misperceptions resulting from the misinterpretation of information received by our sensory organs is known as illusion. Illusion is experienced by all of us. They result from the external stimulus situation and generate the same kind of experience in each individual. That is why they are also known as primitive organizations. Although illusions can be experienced by the stimulation of any of our sense organs, but psychologists have researched out and found that they are more common in the visual rather than in the other sense modalities. For example, in a desert, we have talked about, we have learned about optical illusion taking place where the travelers, they may see a pool of water somewhere, right? This is also an example of illusion, though it actually does not happen. There are two types of illusion. One is known as geometrical illusion and the other is called the apparent movement illusion. Now, let us understand what is meant by geometrical illusion. Geometrical illusion is also known as the Muller Lyre illusion, right? Uh, if you see the two figures, uh, where in the first figure there are two lines, one with the arrows pointing inwards and the other with the arrows pointing outside, outwards. So uh, 
in the Muller Lyre illusion experiment, uh, it has been found that people generally are of the view that the line with the arrows appears to be smaller as compared to the line without the arrows. Besides Muller Lyre illusion, some other visual illusions are also experienced by human beings. Uh, for example, this you can uh, in the second figure you can see the vertical horizontal illusion, where uh, even though both the lines are equal, the vertical line is always perceived to be longer than the horizontal line. Next is the apparent movement illusion. This illusion is experienced when some motionless pictures are projected one after another at an appropriate rate, also known as the phi phenomena. When we see moving pictures in a cinema hall, we are influenced by such a kind of illusion. Similarly, if you see the electric lights during any festive occasion, the flickering of electric lights or the movement of the lights in a particular pattern is also a kind of illusion. For the experience of this kind of illusion, Verdimer, who was a Gestalt psychologist, had reported the presence of appropriate level of brightness, size, spatial gap, of different lights to be important. In the absence of these, the light points will not appear as moving. So these are the conditions for the illusion to take place. They will, if this is not present, they will appear either as one point or as different points appearing one after another without any experience of motion. Now let us understand the socio-cultural influences on perception. Several psychologists have studied the processes of perception in different socio-cultural settings. The question is, does a perceptual organization of people living in one culture differ from that of the others? We have already done the Muller layer and vertical horizontal illusions. Psychologists have used these figures with several group of people living in Europe, Africa, and many other places. Sigal, Campbell, and Herskowitz carried out the most extensive study of illusion by comparing the samples from remote African villages and Western urban settings. It was found that African subjects showed greater susceptibility to horizontal vertical illusion, whereas the Western subjects, they showed greater susceptibility to muller lyre illusion. Similar findings have been also found in other studies. Living in the dense forests, the African subjects, they experienced mortality because normally in Africa, you have tropical evergreen forests and you have very long trees uh, with a you know, very thick uh, cover, like you have uh, Maogani trees over there, you have yam, cassava, et cetera. So these Western, uh, the, however, the Westerners who lived in the environment where uh, the rooms have right angles, they develop a tendency to underestimate the length of lines uh, characterized by enclosure. This conclusion has been confirmed in several studies. In some other studies, people living in different cultural settings have been given the pictures for identification of objects and interpretation of depth or other events represented in them. Hudson did a study in Africa and found that people who had never seen pictures had greater difficulty in recognizing objects depicted in them and in interpreting the depth cues. It was indicated that informal instruction in home and habitual exposure to pictures were necessary to sustain the skill of pictorial depth perception. Sinha and Mishra have carried out several studies on pictorial perception using a variety of pictures with people from diverse cultural settings like hunters, gatherers, people who are doing agriculture, who are living in cities. Their studies indicate the interpretation of pictures is strongly related to cultural experiences of people. So we can understand that perception is definitely influenced by socio-cultural factors. With this, we come to an end to that part of this chapter of sensory perception and attentional processes. I hope this chapter has been interesting enough for all of you. Thank you.